So just to pursue that a little bit more, I mean, what was the sensitivity to the quality of the evidence in the government? Was, you know, when you are in, do you go to Obama and say, this is a randomized control system, oh, gee, that's great? Or, I mean, I, just how does it work? You know, I viewed my job, and the president said that he relies on the Council of Economic Advisors to provide him objective, unvarnished evidence about what will do the most good for the most people in the country. So I viewed my job as trying to aggregate the evidence, say where it's in agreement, where it's compelling, and where it's not. And I remember one of the first meetings I had with the president, and I said, Mr. President, the evidence here is not dispositive. And then he said, when is it ever dispositive in economics, which is a fair, <laughs> fair jibe. And this was a case where it really was particularly non-dispositive. Um, so I think people do recognize that there are more compelling studies than others. And I think they do take that into account. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to trump other considerations. And there is, as uh, the, uh, both of the previous speakers mentioned, there is something of a conflict when it comes to some of the agencies where they don't want evidence out in the public if it's not supportive. We had a wonderful randomized control uh, experiment in the US done in the early, earlier in the 2000s of the Job Corps program. It was probably $60 million Mathematica study where 16,000 participants were randomly assigned to Job Corps. Uh, the results were mixed. The Labor Department sat on them for at least three years. I got a copy of the report when I was writing for the New York Times and wrote it up in the newspaper, which is how it got released. So one of the things which is included in uh, the memorandum that Jeff Science issued is that the agencies have to release the analysis that they're, they're doing. Because there is, there, there is a conflict of interest. Even in the Bush administration, which was not necessarily a fan of job training programs, the administrator of that program kind of identify with the program. Uh, but by and large, I would say those who are forming the policy want it to be effective. They want to get it right. And even those who have more political antenna, or only political antenna, they want to know where the criticism's going to come from. So, so they are interested in the evidence. And, and this is aside from what Michael, when Michael said um, uh, policy-based evidence. Evidence is used a lot in selling the policy. I tried to abstract from that and just think about the policy formation. Uh, but when it comes to selling the, ev uh, selling the policy, people certainly want to know which evidence is supportive. So coming back, do you want to add something? Yeah, go ahead. No, just a, a small piece. I think in politicians, they don't really um, use uh, only evidence as, as what we tend to think from the academia. They, what they get, they, they get stories. So. So what you are really competing in, what, what, I mean, the real competition is about stories. So it's true that actually you can, you can have a, a better story and with more people that are more, that are more credibility that support this story. But what I, when with the president and with the ministers and the politicians, all of them, they're listening to stories. It's not that they really quote the paper, but they get stories in their heads. And, and that's basically what, at the end of the day, uh, uh, rules the, the, the votation and everything in, in, in politics. But they do use polls. So one of the analogies I always tried to use was this is like a poll and it's not within the margin of error. Uh, so that was one where, way I thought, because you're absolutely right. Uh, they are very good at collecting stories and people learn through stories and sometimes their stories are anecdotes and not representative. So I found that sometimes was helpful way of bridging the way that they think about the yeah, world. My, my only point is that if you, cannot, if you don't translate the solid evidence into a story, it won't have a big impact. That's the only thing. Yeah, no, 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 that's fair. I would say that the most critical point is time. Uh, when you're a policy maker, you have nothing against evidence. But you have your calendar, your agenda, you have the opinion polls of this month, you have uh, what's written in the newspaper this morning, you have the election next year. And so when the most bright economists come in front of a policy maker saying, you see, on unemployment, we don't know very well, but we have a fantastic program. In one year, the first year we'll design it, the second year we'll implement it, the third year we'll do the analysis, and within three years we'll come back with a solution <laughs> to your problem. They laugh at you. And it's a real problem because you can't avoid these three years. So your job is to be able to anticipate and think we, there are some problems on which no interest to do uh, ex uh, randomized experimental scene on it because it will be too late. There are some problems who will be in the agenda in two or three years. So you have to start right now to do the experiments and to come back at the right time. 
it's interesting to come back with the result one year before the general election to say, if you want to feed your own programs, take our results. And it was quite successful uh, in France this year, for instance, there was a debate to uh, how to fight discriminations. And uh, the François Hollande had in his program the fact that we should have anonymous curriculum vitae. And uh, Tim from uh, Bruno Crépon and others showed that it was totally inefficient. And it was published just at the right moment, and they were able to give up these proposals from their programs and to try to shift to other kind of policies. But it's really the most critical point. It's the question of the agenda. So, I mean, coming, I was continuing uh, with you, Martin. Uh, the, the results from this fund you ran, did they fit into policy? You know, this, where there, this, I assume this is an example of that, but were there others that were, or maybe some what? did and some other didn't. Uh, I'm obliged to tell you the truth. Uh, actually, <laughs> uh, I was not actually, exactly. What was so. very disappointing is that uh, we were able to mobilize hundreds of uh, uh, local authorities, NGOs, actors, and many academics to do many programs. We, for, for the first time, we were able to. To, to spend a lot of, 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 uh, uh, of money just on programs which were uh, evaluated and strictly evaluated ex ante and not exposed as we do uh, as usual. So we have some influence on local practices. So there are cities, big cities, where they change their practices. They reform their uh, uh, social benefits and so on and so. But at the national level, we had only a few uh, uh, changes. We had two or three changes in the educational system. We were able to change the policy about how we fight dropout. We don't have the results now, and so the politicians are disappointed because uh, we know that we, we started the process, we, shift, we shifted the policies, and I'm sure that if we continue in the future, we'll have results within three of five years, but not now. But uh, we almost give up this strategy. Um, uh, it's like if we were a, a big company with difficulties saying we will close our R&D department, research and Dev development department, because it's not the most useful instrument tool that we need. So we are just between is in the in-between situation, meaning we have first results, we give the, we, we, the evidence that you can act and you can have policies influence, I, love, I like your expression, influenced by evidence, but at the same time, with emergencies and so on and so, we're trying to give up the fact that we'll fund in the future of that. That's why I call for the academics to say, don't, I will tell them, don't be shy. If you go on the front page, and I do agree with you, you have to be Greenpeace, uh, to be able to have uh, articles in newspaper, go on the radio saying, well, it's the wasted money if you throw it through the windows. If you don't do it, and it, will, it will be bad for your children, for the unemployed. We can find the good solutions, and the, the policy makers can follow good ideas and so on and so, we can have results. And I, I would ask if in, in countries like France, we could ask the parliament to be obliged to consider what happened in the science before making a new law. That's the, the kind of things that we could improve if we don't want to reverse and go back to uh, the obscurity. So I know you wanted to intervene. I wanted to add a question to your interview. I mean, so one challenge, I think, exactly coming out of this is that you know you have some of these things. It's going to take a few years to find out. There's a political cycle. You go, you're facing that very much in Chile. You know, you one government might have commissioned the studies. Yeah. How do you get ownership of that knowledge by the country and not by just one government? Because clearly, where governments shift, it's that's that's going to be a major challenge. If you 
the, so I think the, the time issue is, is a key one in, into, into the idea of bringing evidence into politics. And, and one, one way we found in Chile that worked, worked pretty well was that you should not only look at the randomized experiments or RCT as a way to evaluate one program, but as a way to illuminate some theory. So theory, it will change all the time. It's a continuous process of changing what we know. Uh, so if you have theory over there changing all the time, you can always get information from that theory into the narrative that you will use in any moment of time. In concrete terms, in Chile, when we created the new uh, Minister of Social Development, because actually it was the Minister of Planning, but we had to translate that to, to change the whole thing, we introduced a very nice law that now is mandatory for any new social program that you want to create when you send the law to the Congress. It has to bring with a small um, sheet that actually shows what is the evidence that support this, uh, that is available in the world that support this idea. It's a very simple article in the law that forces the executive branch, who is the only one who can send a new social program, to show to the Congress what is the evidence that is actually wow. supporting this. Uh, so, so RCTs, from my, from my opinion, are more effective in the design process than uh, because of the time cycle, then afterwards, because it, obviously it's too late. Uh, you get very late. The, 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 the knowledge from the RCTs, you get it like five years later. So, so it's more about theory, illuminating the design process of social policy. Uh, I, I agree with that completely. And there are often situations where you're relying on theory from what you've learned, which has a much longer time horizon in terms of developing. Uh, I want to say you cannot understate the short time horizons of politicians. It's truly extraordinary. They seem to be living week to week. I can tell you one anecdote. Um, I was involved in the uh, debt ceiling, and one of my contributions was I calculated for the first time in the history of the United States confidence interval for when we would hit the borrowing limit, the debt ceiling, <laughs> which turns out to be pretty wide. And uh, we would try to explain that to members of Congress. You know, you don't want to play games with this. It's kind of, we don't know how much money's coming in or going out. And uh, we got a phone call saying, uh, how much money uh, do we need to raise the debt ceiling by so that we hit it by Thanksgiving? You know, and I could have told them within two weeks. <laughs> um, but they you know, are thinking very much about a very short time, time calendar. And of course, when it comes to doing research in the US, one way in which it continues from administration to administration is NIH and National Science Foundation fund a lot of it. And they are now under threat. The support for social science within the National Institutes of Health is under, under threat. Um, and uh, I think that's actually a very dangerous development in the US, which has not gotten that much support, under threat by the uh, House of Representatives. Yeah, I, I, I actually wasn't named in one of the studies that were particularly condemned in the House of Representatives, <laughs> an NSF-funded <laughs> study. <laughs> uh, so I am. I, you're I'm you're familiar with this. I'm, I, I precipitated it. <laughs> the, there is also something which is important uh, in my mind. There is a French proverb saying that nobody is prophet in its own country. And it's very useful to have uh, foreign uh, experts uh, uh, giving uh, opinions and helping to make programs. And I think that uh, the fact that you can have uh, American academics or Indian academics or Chilean academics uh, coming and uh, being able to help in other countries, it, it helps really a lot to go faster and to credibilize. And in each country, I would say that the academics need the help of academics from other countries to be stronger to convince. It's very efficient. Uh, so it would be, I would recommend some in some countries that the economic committees would add some experts from other countries to influence the process. So we're, we're going to run out of time soon. So I, I thought I'll give you each a minute to have a thought that maybe for the future, for JPL's work, I think we will hear a little bit, I think one of the places where we want to I think be improve our effectiveness is in influencing policy, and in particular policy in government. So 
maybe we start in reverse order, starting with you, Alan. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I have to say, I was struck by how many issues I uh, had to deal with where there was relatively little research available. And that's in part because the policy goes so deep in the weeds. I mean, I'm an expert on unemployment insurance, and I had never heard of the look back provision, uh, which relates to how the unemployment rate in the last three years affects the uh, uh, ability to get extended benefits. So some of the work is not that glamorous for academics to do. And I think it is important that we try to extrapolate from the experimental evidence, non-experimental evidence we have, so we can apply it in other, in other situations. But I also think it's very important for uh, academics to be persistent. And that's not our strength. Our strength is to move on to the next paper. So maybe an organization like J-PAUL can focus on persistence, because sometimes the window opens up. Um, and if you're just hanging around and you happen to have the right study, you can actually have a big impact. Uh, and often the window is closed, but sometimes it does open up. And it's not in the interest of a top academic just to be hanging around some senator's office uh, for the right moment. That's a very useful one. Felipe. So my, um, I will invite um, Jabel to take more risk in, 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 in moving into the political arena. I know it's not a comfortable zone for um, for, for those who actually wants to be rigorous all the time, I will invite Jepal to sometimes, and actually you could have kind of different offices so you, can don't, you, don't, you won't blame the, the, the professors at Harvard or MIT, but, but, but it's sometimes better if, if we have institutions in different Latin American countries or Europe or even um, United States or Asia to have uh, more guys from Jepal screaming about what we should do, even though you may, you may from 10 suggestions that we get from Jepal, you even you may be wrong in two, but you will inform at the end of the day, and you will push the agenda. Sometimes we feel a bit lonely in the in the in the, in the politicians. I, I feel lonely about uh, getting pressure from the field, from the from the culture about uh, evidence, the importance of evidence, and the importance of good ideas. So I will invite you to to get into the political arena. It is not easy, but I think you can make a big big change in the way uh, the war is being run. Thank you. That's Two suggestions. The first, now our policies are influenced by the PISA ranking, like the business schools are influenced by the Financial Times ranking. I would recommend to the JPAL, maybe with other institutions, to make an evidence-based ranking, saying for the different countries to show where they have been influenced by that, where they're uh, good, where they have the good instruments, and so on. So that right. could have a great influence of, uh, about uh, the governments. Uh, what, what happened in the educational field is absolutely amazing. The second suggestion is never forget this fantastic sentence from Gandhi saying, first, they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, how could we do better? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.